These two speakers will be talking about the effects of the pandemic on their editorial work, how they and their journals have responded to the challenges and what lessons they've learned in the first two months. Our first speaker is Ines Stefan. Ines is the editor-in-chief of the public health journal Eurosurveillance, and she's also the vice president of EASE. Initially, she trained as a doctor and has a master's in public health and a diploma in tropical medicine. She worked as an internist in a hospital for many years before working into, moving into science publishing, first at Germany's National Public Health Institute as editor for its epidemiological and public health bulletin, and then joining Eurosurveillance. And I must also mention that in addition to her full-time role with the journal, Innes is also a vice president of EASE and has been an act active member of our gender policy committee for several years, where she was part of the group that established the Sex and Gender Equity in Research, or the SEGA guidelines, which we are delighted have now been widely adopted as a standard reporting guideline. Now, Innes' journal Eurosurveillance is published by the European Centre for Disease Control is based in Stockholm, and given the position of Eurosurveillance as a weekly journal specialising in infectious disease epidemiology and being embedded in the European public health scene, the journal has been particularly impacted by the recent pandemic. For example, I, I did a very quick research of the journal and I found 62 articles that had been published on COVID-19 this year alone, and I'm sure I missed a lot of articles. So Innes is very well placed to tell us about the impact of the pandemic on the editorial operation and how they've dealt with the influx of articles. Our other speaker is Naomi Lee, and she's a senior executive editor at The Lancet. Like Innes, she studied medicine, but specialised in surgery rather than public health and worked for almost 10 years in urology. She joined The Lancet in 2014 and now heads the research section of the journal and advises on the research content of the other journals in The Lancet family. While she specialised in surgery, her other area was and continues to be digital medicine and medical technology. Now the tagline of The Lancet is the best science for better lives. And it's not surprising that the website is reporting that it's currently receiving unprecedented numbers of COVID-19 related submissions. So we're extremely grateful that Naomi has been able to join us to share the impact of the virus on the Lancet's operation and describe how they've responded, the changes they've introduced and the effect of their workload in the last few months. Now, both Naomi and Innes will present a short talk about their recent experiences, and then they've kindly agreed to answer questions from me. But whilst they're talking and giving their presentations, please ask questions in the chat box, and we will take them on um, after the event. So please join with me in welcoming Innes first. And Innes, please share with us your presentation that I know you've prepared to talk about the tsunami of COVID-19 articles that you've received. So over to you, Ines. Okay. So, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. And many thanks to Pippa for the kind invitation and the introduction. Ines, um, Ines, sorry to interrupt you. Are you able to turn your sound up a little bit? You're a little bit quiet. Sorry, sorry, yes, I will try, let me see, I have, um, I may have to stop sharing my screen when, uh, let me see where, if I can Look, interrupt. I mean, don't worry, I guess we can all turn our sound up, not a problem, we'll turn our sound up, Ines. Let me see, is it, is it better now? That's much better, thank you. Okay, good, so. Let's move on. So, welcome everyone. And uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, I will um, show you how as editors of a not so big journal that The Lancet and others are trying to flatten our curve and still deliver quality evidence in this time. So, I will start by uh, taking you a little bit, informing you about who we are to, so you understand the setting in which we operate. And I will take you back to the beginning of this year, end of last year, when everything started to happen. And after this, I will take you through February and up to now and show you what the impact was on us as a journal 
and how reviewers, authors, and others reacted. And I will conclude by giving you a personal account of what we saw as a team as challenges and what we saw also as what could work well for us. And maybe you let me know what you think we can do better because we're not yet done. Um, so we are a journal that was established in 1996 and uh, were published as Pippa mentioned by the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. And our publisher was established 15 years ago exactly for a situation that we happen to have now where we need international coordination and collaboration and international in that sense means the European Union um, but also others to stop and control and prevent disease from a crisis. Uh, we're open access, online, indexed in the major databases. Our focus is as of the, the same as you as the ECDC is focused on surveillance, epidemiology, prevention, and control of communicable diseases in Europe. And um, we aim to provide information and data for public health action. So we're, we all have an applied aspect in, in what we select our articles for. And the team shows six ladies here, but in fact, we're just five and we're doing everything. We are our own publishers, so we, we run the journal, we answer emails from authors, but we publish also uh, the articles, we put them online if uh, we need to develop something on, the, on our publication platform, we have to write our own specs, we have to do the testing, and we are also our own press and media office, so we do everything. And you will understand that this is, of course, a challenge in these times. So December and January. At the end of December last year, just before the turn of the decade, uh, shortly before midnight on the 30th of uh, December, uh, uh, December 30. So what happened, there was a post on a platform called ProMed which is an open platform where infectious disease specialists share information. And the information doesn't need to be authoritative. It could be newspaper articles and all sorts of information related to infectious diseases, not only human, but also plants and animals. And it's moderated, um, but it's not judged on in a way. Uh, so what we found there was a request for information because in a city in China, which at the moment then nobody really knew what it was and where it was, uh, they, people had seen a cluster of di pneumonia, which seemed to be of viral origin and for which we didn't know what kind of a virus it was. Uh, so that was when it happened. And then um, this had a stark reminiscence of what happened in 2003, 2000 to when SARS was evolving. And so I followed this up closely, got in touch with our board members who are coronavirus researchers, and also with a few colleagues in, uh, in uh, Hong Kong who are closely, have their ears closely on the ground. And I asked them, what do you think? And they were already worried at that time. And I offered our fast track publication mode. And I said, if you have anything to report on this, data that you would like to share with the community, please get in touch. So on 23rd January, we were able to publish two articles, one which was on the, on the which was looking at the epidemiological features such as mortality, disease, uh, severity, and also uh, the famous R0 uh, from data that was publicly available. These were the colleagues in Hong Kong submitting, and we had uh, another article fully peer reviewed on the on a PCR assay setup that was necessary for labs to prepare should this spread further and set up their laboratory capacity. So we were quite content at that moment in time. And then February and June came. And what you can see here is how this hit us as a small journal. Usually we are expecting and receiving between eight and 900 articles a year. So we've passed the margin of 900 articles per year already in March, as you can see here, and we are now at 1200 and counting. And since 
January 23rd, we had one single issue where we didn't report on COVID-19, but we had, of course, several that reported only on COVID-19. So what was our reaction, the reaction and the response by the small editorial team? We thought, hang on, um, we need to change something. So we further centralized our evaluation of the COVID-19 submissions. So it was me taking all of that over. And I did the pre-selection and mostly also the final selection. But uh, we also decided that we would focus on certain areas where we thought uh, public health needed most information for decision making. So we wouldn't run opinion papers, no matter how valid these opinions were. We would run articles initially on modeling because we needed to know what would be our mode, how is this going to develop, what would be the incubation period and where would we go. And a lot of information was also necessary in how to detect uh, this virus. So we had closer ties with the associate editors and board members who have specific expertise and we use them more, which was good in the beginning, but over time they were themselves quite busy. So sometimes we were going back to a situation where we had to ourselves decide. We were lucky because we had one of our staff on part-time leave. We were bringing in an extra pair of hands, which can be a challenge, but it's good once they're trained. And we increased the rejection rate, of course, and we learned to say no also to interesting pre-submission inquiries. And as you can see from the quote in the box below, this doesn't have an adverse effect because people really appreciate if you're honest and open. So authors uh, who have different apps, who have different attention from a journal, of course, then the editors, their perspectives were ranging from pleasure to frustration and a lot of pressure was exerted on us. Uh, people would be very, would be perceived by us, of course, as, as pushing for their articles when they themselves were pushed to put out information, scientific information. And the information that could have been published maybe on an open website or somewhere was seen as being more authoritative and giving more weight if it was published in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, then, of course, uh, some people were very happy if they saw their articles published, and you would see some examples there. But then a lot of people were, of course, frustrated and angry. And what I realized over the time of the duration, with the duration of the pandemic and the pressure being harder, not only on professional, but also on, on the personal life, uh, that the way how, how authors voice their anger became much more strong. And you can see here, like someone is saying, is the review crazy? So this is not the way we normally wish to interact, of course. It happens in so-called peace times as well, but these ways of expressing strong feelings were happening more often. And so what did the reviewers do? I mean, the reviewers are the people that we obviously need. So the reviewers supported us predominantly. Reviews were really, really helpful. And as you can see, I, I put quotes here. And uh, some, they, they offered the evenings and they offered to, to look at papers in their holidays. And of course, they were very busy themselves. So sometimes uh, reviewers with the best of intention accepted to review, but then um, it didn't come back. And uh, we, of course, followed up, and then sometimes they were felt to uh, to give us some the need to give us something, and then it could be that the comments were not really helping us, and we were going back to the square zero in a, in a little in a way, and, and we had to decide on our own what happened with the paper or review again, find someone else, because finding reviewers. Where were they and where are they is something that I am sure a lot of uh, other journals working in the same field will feel strongly. Um, they often politely reviewed and the majority of them are simply overwhelmed, overloaded, flooded. That's a lot what we hear. So then all this coming back to the editor, what? how did we feel? And we felt, well, it's a lot. And sometimes we even felt it simply too much. 
And for myself, I often had the feeling that I had a déjà vu. So I wasn't sure, have I read this study before? And where have I read it? Or what, did I see it in the media? Because I'm living in Sweden, I follow the Swedish media, uh, being in an international environment, or follow, of course, BBC, another British media, or, or uh, US-based media. And being German, I follow the media in my home country. So the feeling of not being able to follow, lagging behind, not knowing really what is out there, not matching authors' expectations of terms of timeliness, and feeling sometimes that the media have more authoritative information than we do, uh, it was sometimes a bit frustrating. And uh, in all of this, we still have, and we still have the aim of really upholding our standards and quality, because giving in on the short run may help, but on the long time term, it doesn't really help. And moreover, in our field in medicine, decisions that are not based on sound evidence and, and good science will have a negative impact on people's lives and their well-being. What another frustration that we as a small journal sometimes face, and we are, um, I didn't mention this, but we are among the top 10 ranking journals when you look at the impact factor and also our other metrics are quite good, even though we're such a small journal is the limited visibility because if you open databases the big publishing houses of course have a banner there and they say look at the Elsevier resources look at uh, uh, the science resources and the big journals are taken taken much more forward and they get much more of the limelight even though we sometimes feel we have such a nice study and we would really be like like to see this a bit more reflected also in non-science media and the backlog of other articles when we focus so much on COVID is, of course, another problem. So this brings me to my last slide. Uh, challenges and what worked well. The challenges I mentioned a lot. I did not mention the preprints so much, but preprints have become a bit of a challenge because we're sometimes asking ourselves, if we publish a review, or yesterday we published a meta-analysis of serological test performance based a lot on preprint work, work that isn't peer reviewed, and how would that impact on our published meta-analysis if someone finds the flaw in the sensitivity or specificity as it's published in a preprint, and how does that translate, and how does that impact later when we have to think about the quality of our studies that we published? Uh, rushed work, everyone knows that, of course, pressure for time. For me personally, authors with no orchids, that may sound funny, but of course, European names are much more familiar, and I have an idea of I, have I worked with the person or not before, but it's been a challenge when we got received a lot of submissions from China, because if there were no orchids, it was much more difficult for me to uh, connect the name to the person behind. So. And I think it must be the same for uh, a Chinese expert with more European names. Not giving in on quality standards and, of course, keeping our work-life balance, working at home and uh, not having, uh, you know, not having to leave to an office does not set a real end to your working day. Work, work well, tight-knit team. We know each other well. We work together long and everybody's really motivated, jumping in for each other. Strong routine but still some flexibility, trusted relations with authors and reviewers who would help also if it was difficult sometimes, bringing in an extra pair of hands, being honest, as I showed. And the most important for us is also the feeling that our work has a purpose, is meaningful, and we can contribute a small share by providing sound evidence that will help to control and prevent disease and have a positive impact on people's lives. I think I've taken more than 10 minutes, but Pippa said it would be okay. And uh, I thank a lot for your attention. And I'm, of course, happy to hear your thoughts later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ines. That was, that was really interesting. And I think some of the statistics that you gave us were really quite shocking. 
So what I'm going to um, ask now, I'm going to pen to the questions now, and I'd like to um, ask Naomi if you can give us your presentation now, because I think it would be a very nice contrast with two journals undergoing very similar experiences, but coming at it from slightly different perspectives. So Naomi, can I ask you now um, to unmute yourself and turn your video on and, and share your screen. Thank you very much. Okay, can everybody see and hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Sorry, on mute. <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks very much, everyone. Okay, thanks, Pippa, for the introduction, and Ennis, thanks for a fantastic talk. It's really interesting hearing that and hearing the parallels between what we've both experienced, and obviously you're doing that with a much smaller team. Um, so here we are in the UK. We've been in lockdown for a couple of months, and I wanted to say that as a professional and a working mother, the biggest feeling for me when we went into lockdown was that there was a curtain between the two parts of my life that had been whisked away. And all of a sudden I had kids crashing into my Zoom meeting. And here I think this is the kind of pinnacle in that I'm joining a conference of over 100 people from my bedroom. So welcome. And for me, this is a real moment because not only am I not ashamed to show you my bedroom, but I've actually been really excited and looking forward to this. So thank you, Pippa, for the invitation. So six months and 10 minutes, it's quite a huge challenge. Um, I'm Naomi, you've muted yourself. Okay, I'm back. Um, I just said six months and 10 minutes is quite a huge challenge. I hope that I can step up to this. The background, Ines has said, a lot of you I'm sure are experiencing similar situations, but we've also had a huge increase in volume of submissions. So uh, overall across the whole of the group, we've seen three times submissions, but this is over the course between January and year to date, now to June. Some sections of the journal have seen 10 times as many submissions as usual. Some have experienced hundreds per day at the peak, which for us was around Easter. We've also seen our capacity decreased. So although we're a much bigger team, we're 20 journals, we're over 150 people. We have the Lancet Weekly, which is a general medical journal, but we also have specialty journals. We have two very broad biomedical journals. We have a preprint server, um, but our capacity decreased. The office was closed overnight from 11 o'clock on a Sunday night for Monday the next morning. Um, schools are closed here in the UK. We're a predominantly female workforce, so many people have caring responsibilities. We've had illness across the team. We've had uh, deaths of family members. And of course, uh, upon all of that, we've had ultra fast track timelines. Um, yeah, so thinking about the challenges, I thought of those in five broad areas and I'll just quickly run through them now and how we've uh, reacted to those. So first of all, the operational challenges, very similar to what Inez described, we had to increase the efficiency of our workflow. And one of those key things was thinking about how we cascade or, or offer different journals within the family. Normally we would uh, have a very kind of, uh, we would speak to other editors within the family about most papers that we have that were not within our area. But given that almost everybody was working on COVID-19, we were able to kind of streamline that a bit and make decisions for other journals to suggest or not suggest. Um, and then we tried to uh, make a decision on one at the first point of submission for all of those papers so that authors weren't then shopping around different journals in the family. We normally do that, but we increased that. We uh, reduced our work. So uh, slightly similar to what Inez said, we, for some of the kind of non-core functions, so our world report section, some of the comments or news, we saw that we wanted to prioritize uh, original research. And so we reduced some of those sections in order that we could redistribute our workforce. We also were able to bring in freelancers, uh, some experienced team members, uh, who one of whom retired last year, came back to help us. Um, and we did a lot to facilitate flexible hours. You know, as I said, with the challenges that we knew the workforce were experiencing, we shortened meetings, we increased our deadlines uh, for editors to kind of respond so that people could work early morning, overnight, wherever they kind of could and, and needed to. And that really had the benefit of uh, facilitating a full kind of 
membership of the team to the global offices that we have. The majority of us are based in London, but we have offices in, in China, in the US. We also have team members based across Europe. And so though there has always been that dichotomy between those who were in the main office and those who weren't until the moment that we locked down for the pandemic. So there's one positive uh, outcome there. I also wanted to touch on the volume. You know, as I said, we've seen three to 10 times the response the number of submissions as well, but we have had the same pressure to keep the response time short. Not only because while you're holding the paper, you feel like you are sitting on information that could be potentially important in making decisions for clinicians, policymakers, researchers through the pandemic, but also because authors need a quick decision so they can move on and, and submit elsewhere. And so we know that across the, the portfolio, we've dedicated an absolutely huge amount of time to just sorting through what you refer to, Pepper, is the tsunami of uh, submissions. And I think for us, this has really outlined the role of editors in this curation and finding the most robust and impactful papers and pursuing those to publication. And that, I think, has really brought home to us at The Lancet the importance of different homes for different types of research. So preprints, for example, uh, without that kind of selection filter, but there's a huge amount that can be quickly and transparently published. And so a, a great kind of place for research that needs that kind of quick transparency, get, get something out so that pe people can react on it. But then the role for peer reviewed journals for that kind of curation for impact and, and robustness. Um, and we've also, similar to Inez, had the same challenges. You know, what of everything else? We're a, a journal that has commissioned content. We run kind of uh, huge projects over the course of a couple of years, focusing on different issues. And almost everything else, at least temporarily, has kind of moved to the back burner. And we're, we're looking now at how we put those up again. Um, there's expectations uh, of speed and quality. And we know that we have to move quickly, but we also need to keep the same if not a greater level of scrutiny. And obviously that's a really high risk situation. Um, also thinking about the way that the knowledge has changed at the outset of the pandemic. Initially, knowledge of COVID-19 was very low, but the field has moved incredibly fast. So there's a real moving bar for publication in different journals. At the outset, for example, we published a cohort of 40 patients from Wuhan describing the clinical characteristics of the virus and that was one of the first publications that we had on the 24th of January and obviously at the time when people knew nothing about that virus that was an incredibly kind of important and impactful publication however now in the space of just six months that isn't the kind of publication that would continue to add and we wouldn't consider something like that now for publication um, so you can see that even in just six months the kind of scientific dialogue has moved at just such a breakneck speed and while I don't think the expectations of speed will continue to such an extent, I do think that um, there will not, we will not be able to return to days when we spent kind of months and months pursuing something from submission to publication when we've shown that we can do it much more quickly. Um, so I'm sure this is something that will continue. Um, on public engagement, so there's been an unprecedented level of engagement with uh, science and scientific research. And this is something that we've been really aware of at The Lancet. So aware of how the research that we publish, that you publish, that's on preprint service is now making the kind of mainstream media. And people are familiar with the concept of the R number. People are talking about what the preprint research uh, finds. And that's obviously fantastic. It's exciting, but it brings an extra kind of layer of responsibility when we're communicating the findings of research, because we need to say whether it's a comment, whether it's a hypothesis, or whether this is original peer reviewed research and be really clear. Um, and for us, we've also been very kind of cognizant of the weight that uh, the Lancet's name brings. And we have tried really hard to uh, ensure kind of quality um, and not be too speculative. You know, there are many good pieces of research that I'm sure we've all seen, um, which are a great piece of scientific discourse, but could, um, if published perhaps by The Lancet, suggest a weight to it, which it doesn't have. Um, again, with the kind of speed, uh, when thinking about public engagement, we've had communications to our team where we've said, oh, we submitted this yesterday, can we press release it? Um, and that's obviously, you know, we've never had a situation like this before. We, the research has been submitted to us, but we've barely even read it. And we're just sending it out for pre-review. And we're having requests like that, that we're having to 
kind of negotiate and, uh, and navigate. Um, and of course, we would never ask researchers to hold on to any kind of important biomedical information in the midst of a crisis. And so kind of, again, that's a changing expectations for people where they expect to kind of keep their research findings hidden for this grand unveil. And of course, that's not what you want to do in a pandemic. So it changes the role of the journal, uh, the role of the researcher. And I think, again, you know, it gives importance to different types of scientific communication. There's also a huge political dimension to this health crisis. Uh, the Lancet was quoted uh, in uh, Trump's letter uh, threatening to defund the World Health Organization, and in this case erroneously, and we had to react quickly. But this is just one example of a kind of the huge geopolitical tensions that have arisen over this crisis, um, and even geopolitical tensions coming down to certain leaders backing certain treatments before evidence has come out. So then even a piece of scientific discourse ends up having a kind of political dimension to it. Um, almost at the end, but I just wanted to say, you know, for us, for all of us editors, I think it's you know, a terrible, terrible time, but it's also a kind of fascinating and exciting time to be an editor. When I left surgery for academic publishing, you can imagine that a lot of my friends and family were wondering why. And I hope, you know, uh, to some extent on a personal level for all of us that we've been able to give people an insight into the life of being an editor. You know, it's exciting to see new research, to participate in this debate. It's a privilege to be part of shaping the narrative it's a huge responsibility um, and I think you know that's an extra pressure for all of us working in different circumstances um, and I think one that we all need to take uh, really seriously so I'm going to finish just uh, with two lessons uh, the first was about operational so really we were very very lucky that over the last few years we've gone to a digital first workflow we had been quite paper-based before um, and an increasingly flexible working environment. And these will never go back with a lot of the things that we've changed operationally because we've realized that not only does it give our team members flexibility, but it also enables us to be more really, realistically a global organization. And then the, other, the last point was really just about the vitality and value of science and academic publishing. I think we've seen throughout the pandemic what an important role science and academic publishing has to play. And I hope that we have um, kind of shared that with the general public um, and, and many of the changes that I think we have had to adopt, we will keep going forward. Um, but I really think that this has brought us into centre stage for better and for worse. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that, Naomi. That was uh, fascinating and also slightly terrifying, I've got to admit. So if I could ask you if you could uh, stop sharing your screen and hopefully we'll bring on Ines as well and um, so then we can have a discussion. Right, so um, just to ask Mary, could you, um, if you could disable the three screens that are showing there, your, yourself, uh, Federica and the advert breaks, that would be great. And if possible we can go to the gallery view of discussion but if not we will carry on so thank you very much for it I think it's I think you've raised a lot of important issues um, some of which you're finding answers to and some of which we're not finding answers to so I think the first question I'll, I'll start with the first question that I had for you and then we've had quite a lot of questions come in the chat and the Q&A so I'll refer to those I think I guess one of my first questions is about the quality of the articles that you're receiving because given that there's been effectively quite a rush to do research to promote it and Naomi you mentioned about authors trying to get information out faster rather than waiting for a great reveal are you as, uh, as editors um, do you think the quality of articles is reducing? And this is also thinking of two aspects, partly the quality of research, but also the quality of presentation. You know, are they following the right reporting guidelines? Are they making their data available? So perhaps if I could start with you, Naomi, to ask you what you think about this. Yeah, thanks. I, I think it's difficult to say too broadly because, you know, Within that huge amount of volume, yes, there have been a number of low quality submissions, you know, that's undeniable. However, there have also been a huge number of very high quality submissions. And, you know, as Ines said, there were 
points where we were having to turn away things, not because they were not interesting and not well done, but really just because we didn't have space and we weren't able to prioritize them. So I would say the response from the scientific community, I think, has been incredible, overwhelming, producing such high quality research that has moved us forward so you know an incredible way in six months between a new disease to something where we're you know seeing results of trials yes of course there have been low quality submissions there have been submissions that don't meet guidelines i think that there's also a huge amount of debate at the moment on kind of poor quality trials that might be recruiting that we might be seeing for publication um lack of coordination around research efforts so yeah, there's a huge amount, I think, still to do, not just about the kind of writing up and reporting guidelines, because I think, you know, that's something that can be fixed. If, if, the, if the quality of the trial is OK, we can go back to people and say, you haven't followed the correct guidelines at revision. You need to provide this information. But it's also about the kind of quality of the trial uh, in its kind of imaginations. Um, and I think we'll also see we'll see ongoing issues there as we move forward. Yeah. Thank you. That, that's interesting. Ines, what's your experience in this area? Uh, you're still on. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I would say the same. We see very varied um, submissions. Of course, uh, you, see, you see the whole spectrum, I would say. Uh, so you see very good submissions, and very, very good science and very good investigations. And it's surprising how fast people can do those. Um, and sometimes you see they're just not written up in the right way, which can be fixed. And uh, another time, you, you, there's nothing to really fix. Uh, my main concern was also all the time that you saw a lot of we saw a lot of reviews, and uh, where where of course they, they they were not always done systematically. So a lot of narrative reviews where. Mm, it's a bit difficult to judge, particularly if these are dealing with preliminary information, so the quality could be seen as being a bit so and so. And also, with what, what I think is, it has been a challenge also for people, as, as Nomi said earlier, what was right and what was good quality and good evidence three weeks before and what you'd send for peer review may not have the same quality. Uh, Damp anymore when it comes back because uh, science has moved on so much in these three weeks. So it's very difficult to make a, a blanket statement for everything. I think it varies, but it's good, good stuff. Yeah, I, th I think I actually find that quite in, quite heartening because one of the you know one of the concerns about this environment is if there is so much pressure on the researchers to get the stuff out is whether they you know whether the rush is lowering the quality of what they're getting out but i think from what both you and naomi have said that the variability is no greater or less than it is normally in terms of the quality of articles and i think that's that is actually quite that's quite beneficial if i could i could add that in that also um, the role of the editor becomes more important in firstly selecting and also seeing potential when it is not necessarily written up in the first place, that it looks like it's good science. You can guide people where you see the findings behind the presentation have a possibility. You can give authors the right, you can guide them in the right direction. And so I think the positive thing is that we have seen that the role of editors in this situation is much more important than the role of just you know, putting everything in a preprint. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that, Inez. I think that's so true. You know, the role of the editor in kind of curation and responding to that moving bar and finding things that will be impactful from this huge volume. Mm. No, very much. Right, we have to, we have two questions, and the first question I'm I'm I will give you both questions, and you'll understand why in a minute. Um, the, because the first question is rather tricky. So the first question, um, it's because of re what's happened recently and talking about um, retractions and, you know, I'm sorry, Naomi, but you knew it was going to come up with the Surgisphere case. Um, but the question is about, you know, what, is, what, are, what relationship or what role do journals have and should journals have in the political sphere 
how much should they be influencing and how much should they be engaging with political discussions in this time of example. Now, to give you a few minutes to think about that, because I think that is, you know, given the nature of The Lancet as such a prominent journal and Euro surveillance because of the nature of being published by the ECDC and being part of the European community, I'll start with what I hope will be an easier question for you, um, which is whether you foresee overarching changes in the journal's workflow and models uh, post-COVID. And Naomi, you, you mentioned yourself that you said you didn't think we'd be able to go back to the length of time we take, we've taken traditionally over articles. And just to say, I've recently just accepted an article which is looking at the speed of acceptance of COVID-19 articles and they seem, and it's reporting five days, which is phenomenally quick. So I think that's a question. So do you foresee overarching changes in workflows? Perhaps if I could start with you, Naomi. Yeah, I mean, yes, I do. Um, I don't think five days is, you know, a target time to aim for because m almost everything requires more work, more getting into shape, more review. You know, that that's incredible. Um, I think that there is probably a kind of sweet spot between rushing um, it, and, and inadequate scrutiny um, and that kind of very kind of long lethargic process where things get delayed and you know there is a kind of there is a kind of sweet spot where we can process things in a realistic time frame and get things out and I do think the expectations and the pressures will be different um, especially because we've kind of responded in this way and, and that's a great thing that's a good thing I think for, for us as an industry. The other question was about um, a business models and, and access and I think you know this has kind of landed right in the middle of that uh, open access debate and I think part of the open access has really been centered on well what's the role of journals subscription journals particularly in the era of preprints you know why would we want something which is a subscription model or you know is a kind of paid model uh, when you can publish something for free so I think you know this is just part of a huge debate and I'm sure that we're going to see changes I'm sure that we will continue that kind of transition to open access and you know that the Lancet group is committed to that um, and to, to making that change I think that you know as we've said the the pandemic for me has strengthened the case for a journal and for the curation of research in that way i think it slightly changes what we might want to publish where if kind of speed and transparency is the key thing it should go to a preprint server if this is something which you can take a couple of weeks to publish and it's still robust and impactful then that's kind of where a journal can can come in so i think most people are you know overwhelmed by the volume of research and so they're looking for some element of curation um, what to read what's new what's novel what's robust um, so yes i do think that we'll see changes quite how this is going to shake down uh, and you know, with the transition to open access, I, I'm not sure at the moment. Yes. I think I think if you had the if you had the answer, Naomi, you would be in a huge demand because the answer is not there yet. But we're on our way. So, Innes, any uh, changes, overarching changes, you foresee to continue into the future? Um, as, as you may know, but I mean, you know that we had a rapid track all the time throughout uh, the existence of the journal, which has so, so we are used to doing this. Um, it's just accelerated and, and it's just been, there have been more articles faster as we say. Um, we, we need to change uh, some things, I guess. Uh, we need to look at that. At the moment, we're so busy in our day-to-day -day operations that I don't think we have a minute to even think what, could we pull through? Where could we change? We made quite a few changes in our workflows last year, and um, we were going to identify. We underwent a lean operation, and we were going to do this again. Uh, so we stopped it. Uh, we're always trying to improve because we're such a we have such a small team. So we're trying to optimize and 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 do things. One thing which I personally feel we should change for us is we need to find a way to get more visibility also in the general media, because we see um, that this would be beneficial for our authors. And obviously this is something that we will think about how we can do that without um, taking away too much from our work. 
Interesting. So more incremental than revolutionary. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. Right now, I'm afraid I do need to come to the tricky question about politics. So uh, perhaps, Naomi, if I could start with you. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, one way to get out of answering it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a great question. Um, I mean, to talk about specifically about the Surgisphere paper, which I can see one uh, somebody was asking in the chat. I think these things happen. Uh, obviously, we are you know really frustrated about the situation and i'm sure you know many people are it was only two weeks ago the paper was published so things are still kind of emerging we're still finding out more um and i know that there'll be many more discussions to come i think the important thing is that we learn from them you know we investigated and we retracted very quickly we're still learning what's happened here it's always going to be a bit of an arms race between people who seek to deceive and editors who are trying to maintain the integrity of the scientific method and the scientific debate. Um, we and many journals, I'm sure, will kind of go back and review processes and policies um, and look again to see what we can do in situations like this. Um, so, you know, that particular paper is a real frustration for, for us and I'm sure for many, many, many people. There's been so much discussion in the media of, of, you know, kind of what happened here and I'm sure there's more to come. Your question was around politics and I think um, the reason I kind of touched on that because I think one of the reasons that paper received so much attention was because of the kind of political aspect of the medical findings. And that, I think, I touched uh, briefly in the presentation has been an ongoing kind of theme throughout the pandemic where because this is such a kind of both a scientific and a political issue it's evident that it's impossible to separate the two but that's not different to kind of medical research certainly in normal times so dr tedros from the world health organization says health is a political choice um, and that's really saying, you know, for, for many diseases, for many disorders, we know how to cure them. It's just that there hasn't been the political will to commit finances or to set society up in a way that that happens. And obviously that's not the situation now with the pandemic, but there's a mix of science and biomedical research and political policy. And we've seen that so kind of so much in the UK where we've kind of had the scrutiny of the scientific advice given to the government by SAGE. People want to understand what that is. And really that's in order that people can pick apart, is there a failure of the scientific method or is there a failure of government in interpreting that scientific advice? And what, are, what can explain the, the kind of over 50,000, possibly 60,000 deaths that we've seen in the UK above and, you know, other European countries. So I think, you cannot separate the two. We, we know that, um, but the pandemic has obviously brought those into sharp focus. Uh, and journals, especially ones like The Lancet, have a role not to stay away from the kind of politics of difficult issues because we should be pursuing the kind of scientific answer and then, you know, presenting that as, a, as, a, as factually as we can. I've just done your trick, started speaking with my mute button on. Um, so thank you very much for that, Nemi. Aware of the time, Ines, do you have perhaps just one statement to make about the role of journals with politics? Um, our view in that is because we're in a complex political environment, we're in public health, we're a European Union agency, we're providing advice and we're providing the evidence, hopefully, that politicians and policymakers can then take forward in making an informed decision. That's how we see we can contribute to provide the best possible evidence for sound decision making and not influencing, not steering policy making in one or the other direction. Thank you. That was very succinct. So thank you very much for that. Um, we're, we're getting quite a lot of questions in on the Q&A and on the chat board. So unfortunately, although we could keep this conversation going for a long time, and I would, you know, we could keep it going for the rest of the, the conference, I think, we are going to have to close the session. So I'm sure everybody would like to join me 
um, in thanking Naomi and Innes for great presentations and uh, some really interesting perspectives. And I apologize to those people whose questions I was unable to answer. Just to say, if you put your question in the chat, then um, I'm sure Naomi and Innes um, will have a look at that and other people also. Will